You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Glenn Thayer. Well, good morning. This is our last day here at the Options Industry Conference. Now, yesterday we heard from Margaret Brennan, um, her candid remarks on Ukraine, COVID, finance, and the political landscape were extremely poignant. We, we basically had our own version of Face the Nation when Craig Donahue came out and joined her on stage for the Q&A. Very, very, very cool. Now, I, I've heard from many of you over the last couple of days that our panel that we had on the rise of retail, it really resonated. And, and I want to, you know, call out JJ again. Thanks for, for moderating that for us. It really sparked a lot of conversations over the last couple of days. I also want to remind everyone that this is your final day to be able to view the industry updates. And just vi- visit the video kiosk that's right outside. It's to the left in the foyer. You can get video updates from OCC, Box Options, SIBO, MIAX, NASDAQ, NYC, SIFMA, and STA. Now, for our golfers that are here and that are hitting the links later today, I want to remind you Shotgun starts at 1 p.m. sharp at the resort course. Head to your signed hole at 1245, and lunch will be provided. Now, as we all know, the current world we live in really forces us to increase our focus on cyber threats across the financial services industry. Kicking us off today will be a discussion with leading security experts giving us the best practices on cyber readiness and strategies for maintaining safe, orderly, and resilient markets. Help me welcome the CEO of OCC, John Davidson, and our panelists, Eric Dries of OCC, Andrew Derbobin at NASDAQ, and David Harris from Manitou. Well, good morning, everyone. I know there's a keen interest in the issue of cybersecurity in our industry. Other than an old man's bladder, uh, I turned 67 on Saturday, this is the risk that most frequently keeps me up at night. Just yesterday, in an interview with the British Broadcasting Corporation, Rob Joyce, who is the director of cybersecurity at the National Security Agency here in the United States, indicated that Russia should not be underestimated, stating, quote, I'm still very worried about the threats emanating from around the Russia-Ukraine situation, close quote. He went on to further state that as the conflict continues and as the sanctions bite on the Russian economy becomes more severe, quote, our worry is that it's a decision point, And when that decision point happens, there is certainly a capability to come after some of that American infrastructure. Joyce also warned that another risk of escalation could come from activists, vigilante hackers who have been targeting Russia to show support for Ukraine. Now, happily, there are things that each of us and the firms for which we work and 
those with whom we interact can do to mitigate some of the risk in the cybersphere. And so here to share their expert perspective with us today are Andrew from NASDAQ, Eric, who leads our cyber defense at the OCC, David from Manitou, which is a software, a cybersecurity software company. And he happens, just by coincidence, to have very extensive experience in our industry. I've prepared some questions for our panelists to start the discussion, and we certainly hope to have time to take questions from all of you on this topic as we move along. So let's get started. Andrew, I'm going to give you the first set of questions. So you are the global head of security operations and incident response for NASDAQ. NASDAQ, as all of us in the options industry knows, runs about half a dozen options market here in the U.S., including Philix and ISE, and, of course, the gigantic NASDAQ stock market. I think what many in the audience may not be aware of is that NASDAQ also runs a number of markets in Europe, and some of those markets are geographically very close to the troubling geopolitical events with Russia's war in the Ukraine, such as NASDAQ Vilnius, NASDAQ Tallinn, NASDAQ Riga, and NASDAQ Helsinki. So, Andrew, what is your strategy at NASDAQ to protect against cybersecurity events in dealing with this diversity of different sizes of markets and presumably some different uh, technology portfolios within those markets? And to the extent that you can comment, what sort of extra steps did NASDAQ take when the situation in the Ukraine uh, and Eastern Europe heated up? Great question. Thanks, John. So our strategy starts way before an active threat. So Russia, uh, Ukraine, the war that's going on in there, we understood that there are threats emulating from Russia uh, into Ukraine uh, and vice versa. We also see that hacktivists are getting into the mix, like John mentioned, they are attacking each other. So our strategy started years ago. We built a cyber defense program that is extremely mature, defense in depth strategy, and standardization across the markets. It doesn't matter if we have a small market in a remote country or one of the largest markets in the world. We're going to protect that with the security best practices and the best industry tools that we have. We're going to analyze these threats that are coming out of Russia, out of Ukraine. We're going to evaluate our networks to ensure that our protections are in place. And as we go through the precautions that we have to take is, do we have the capabilities to thwart any attack that's going on in the, in our, in the environment? So looking at what we're seeing in Ukraine and, and Russia, these are things that we've seen in the past. We've seen DDoS attacks. We've seen variations of, of malware, wiper, ransomware, uh, you name it. We can respond to these by saying, hey, we already have the precautions in place. We should not be making mass changes in order to uh, defend against these attacks that we're seeing. We should already have those tools in place, and that's what we've done uh, on the NASDAQ side. So can I follow up? Absolutely. So when you think about that, you mentioned thwarting. But what, what's your balance between thwarting, so protecting the sort of exterior, and detecting in the event, you know, nation states have a lot of resources and can be really patient. Absolutely. Uh, and maybe they started in 2014 when they were looking mm -hmm. at the Crimea, for example. Do you have that balance sort of thought out between those two uh, potential vectors? Absolutely. So prevention obviously is our first line of defense, right? So we go into prevention and saying, okay, any of the attacks that are coming through, let's prevent them. Let's stop them. Let's design our networks in order to say, hey, if those preventions fail, what's the worst that can happen? Taking a risk-based approach into your environment, doesn't matter if it's a externally facing web server, a secure market that's on the inside that does not have internet accessibility, how do you take those risks and apply those to your environment? We took that approach and said, you know what, we're going to secure our environment by what attackers could do. We stand back and say, okay, I have an environment. 
how are attackers going to get in? How can they uh, infiltrate here? And we take that defense in depth model to say, we're going to protect this because attackers are going to try and come in through this front door. We'll lock that front door. Then we'll get back to another security and say, hey, you know what? We'll put an alarm system on here to do that detection. And all this with efficiency in mind. Great. Thank you very much. Eric, let's turn to you. OCC bills itself as the, quote, foundation of secure markets. And as a central counterparty, people generally think about that in terms of financial integrity, so margins, clearing funds, stress testing, as well as the operational capacity to handle the volume spikes that we've been talking about for a couple of days in the industry. Your area, though, covers a much different part of operational risk, and one which should not have gotten a whole lot of attention 22 years ago when the Encore clearing system was built. So what are the key cyber risks that a clearing organization is concerned about? How did your background in the military and your colleagues' background, some of them in the intelligence community, prepare OCC security services to detect, to mitigate, and to manage those kinds of risks? Sure, thanks. Um, <clears throat> so building on what Andrew just you know, talked about, the threats and our ability to prevent and detect, from a clearinghouse standpoint or any real financial market utility standpoint, <clears throat> it's about availability. So it's the availability of the information, the data, uh, availability of application systems, whatever the case would be. So from an OCC and a market utility standpoint, we care about those avail availability threats. So Andrew mentioned, you know, DDoS, distributed denial of service attacks, um, the hacktivists that take down external websites, so blocking application access, things like that. So from our perspective, that's what our threat mitigation is focused on, is, is those availability attack and those threat actors. On top of that, uh, the military, uh, John mentioned our team has over 150 years of combined experience in the military and government agencies, uh, including the intelligence um, community. And that's put us in a unique position that we can translate all that experience we have from an ever-changing landscape, the visibility into how fast it changes, uh, translate that right into you know, the private sector and, and what we're trying to do to protect uh, OCC as well as all the other market utilities out there and, and being that secure foundation for the markets. And do you still, or your colleagues still have interaction with some of those uh, government agencies uh, that they're uh, in the alumni associations of? Yeah, absolutely. So we have people from every branch of service, uh, Air Force, Army, Navy. We still have uh, several contacts that are active duty on that side. Um, our CSO, Mark Morrison, has significant contacts within the intelligence community still. It's a very close-knit group, uh, and especially having 30-plus years of experience. Um, they grew up together you know, in this cyber landscape that used to be a thought 30, 40 years ago, and now it's a you know, fun of the mind on, for everybody. Thank you. So, David, the exchange-traded options industry was founded in Chicago in 1973, the very same year in which a seminal paper on options pricing was published by Drs. Black and Scholes. Ever since, if you couldn't tell a differential equation from a hole in the ground, you needn't look for a job in this industry. Unbelievable quantums of data are necessary to appropriately price options and manage portfolio risk, and frequently that data needs to move from place to place. What are the challenges facing market participants in keeping that data secure? Is there a significant scale advantage in data security, or can smaller entities compete adequately against the huge firms in that regard? And what are the relevant regulatory constraints in this area, particularly comparing the U.S. to Europe? I know, for example, for the last couple of years, I haven't been able to send my daughter in London articles from the Chicago Tribune because their website doesn't conform to the GDPR guidelines that are in place in all of Europe, including the UK. So give us a little uh, set of thoughts about 
uh, moving information around as well as uh, some of these privacy uh, issues that are coming to the fore at the same time cyber risks are increasing. I can literally spend the rest of the day talking about that one question you just gave me. Mm -hmm. So I am probably the odd fish on the panel in the sense that I'm not a cybersecurity expert. Like literally, um, some of you know me that I was in the industry. I I was responsible for my cyber budget, and I am not sure that I ever asked how big the budget is, right? And now, you know, I unfortunately, when I was in the exchange business, we had a cyber breach. So if my budget was $100 before the breach, it was like $3 million after the breach, Right, and so as John said, right, it's it's this quantum of data that's moving around that actually attracted me to this space, right? Because you know we're at a point now where you know we've been dealing with you know large data pools and we glean information from those data pools, but you don't really get down to the individual level, and there's a whole bunch of reasons you are unable to get down to the individual level, but the individual level has a ton of value, right? And so if you guys think about um, when you signed up for the conference, right, they asked you to download an app, right? And you, you know, some of you probably downloaded the app, um, but no one looked at the privacy policy. So, you know, I, I glanced at the privacy policy. Um, they take about 20 minutes to read on average. Um, so, you know, if you really care about privacy policies, I think the average yearly uh, time spent on reading a privacy policy is 76 days, So if you want to spend 76 days reading the privacy policies of everywhere you go. But here, um, what you gave them is essentially, you know, your name, your address, your affiliation, um, your cell phone number. So it would be interesting, right, for let's say if I were an employer and I was like, look, I really wonder what my people do on these conferences, right? You could count how many people are in this room. And you could say, well, you know, my people didn't wake up early and didn't, don't care about cybersecurity. But I can actually tell exactly who is in this room, right, who they're sitting with, right? I can tell you um, after this, if we strike a chord, right, I'm going to be able to track your web browsing because you gave the app the ability to do that. So I'm literally going to learn tons about you. So as John said, right, his daughter in Europe, Europe is ahead of us in privacy regulation. So... Um, one of the things that I really want to spend a little time when we talk a little later is think about security and privacy is the left hand and the right hand because more and more they're coming together as concepts. So it's not just, hey, um, I need to be secure from outside threats. It is, hey, I need to know the personal data I'm collecting, what I'm using that data for, how it is being stored um, in Europe, And the reason, John, you can't send stuff to your daughter is because many American companies can't comply with European regulation. So they actually have to shut down the services. That is a bad way to do business, right? If you can't comply with the regs, you shut down. So as American companies and as global companies, right, and a lot of your firms are global or aspiring to be global, you need to be thinking right now about this interplay between security and privacy. And... I'll just kind of wrap it up around the competition thing. Don't think of uh, competing small firm against big firm, right? It is not a competition, right? The, the reality is um, that if you're a small firm and you suffer a data breach, I think um, I'm going to get my stat wrong, but I would say like seven out of ten companies fail within six months of a data breach if you're a small company. Right, so do not think of it as a competition. You are not competing, right? You are actually fighting for your survival. Andrew, let's move to a slightly different twist on this. I know that uh, NASDAQ, like ourselves, has a visible commitment to moving their technology environment to the so-called cloud. Are there particular cyber risks in the cloud environment that are different from our sort of uh, older methodology of running so-called on-premises data centers? Um, or do the risks just manifest themselves in, in different ways? 
I would say it's the, it's the latter. It's going to manifest itself in different ways. The threats are still going to be the same. They're, the threats are to our confidentiality, our integrity, and our availability of the application. So when we move to AWS and start the majority of our services moving towards the cloud, we just have to understand those risks, those different attack patterns. So I think the challenge between uh, us moving to AWS is, is resourcing and training and, and knowledge. It's actually a lot of efficiency built into AWS for our security response team. Everything is developed using an API. We can get things done faster. We can have more efficiency. We can use a lot more automation based on those APIs versus the on-prem technology where if you needed a new server, you had to order it, you had to wait for it to come in. With AWS, we hit a button. Within a, a few minutes, we have all the resources we need to do our job. So it's going to enable uh, security in some regards to do a much more efficient job in detecting and responding to adversarial threats. David, how do you think about privacy changes in the cloud environment where literally hundreds of thousands of customers are, are commingled in the same set of data centers. Is that cause for concern, or do those customers have the way to uh, appropriately no, a, isolate themselves? It, no, it, it's, I think it's a cause for concern, but not just because of cloud, right? Because the reality is, you know, you collect a data set, right? And then uh, it may come into your organization appropriately secured, right? But you know, you hire a bunch of summer interns who are doing a data, a pro, you know, data project, right? And they need that data set. So they make a copy of that data set. And so while it came into your organization secured appropriately, uh, a now copy has been made. Now the summer intern, right, is going on vacation, can't finish his project, right? He makes a copy of that data set and sticks it on his laptop, right? So it's, it's more about data proliferation Right? And then under the, a lot of the laws, and these laws are coming to the U.S., right? consumers have a right to know about the data that an organization holds on them. Mm -hmm. so, um, and they have the right to correct that data and the right to be forgotten, which means that the organization needs to know where the data is, and they need to comply within a certain amount of time. So if your data is all over, your, all over the place, um, it's a tough Good one. Luck. Yeah, it's a tough one. Um. Eric, we have this concept that uh, is at least amusing in terms of color choice uh, in the cybersecurity industry, so-called red teams and blue teams. So what are these guys? Are they baseball fans, football fans, went to college in different places? What is it that they do? And if you know, how, how did they get their names? Sure. So, um, so you look at the red team, blue team concept, and there's a bunch of other colors that are out there that people will hear about: purple teams, uh, black teams, white teams. Um, it's all over the place. But the end of the day, uh, what they really mean is what Andrew was talking about: being proactive. Um, and so, it's basically war games for cyber. Uh, and so, we have teams that are designated red teams. They're the aggressor. If you think from a war game military standpoint. Uh, blue team is the defense. Uh, and so we sped up these war games, these exercises, where the red team attempts to compromise a system or compromise an application, steal data, whatever the case may be, whatever their objectives are, while the blue team defends the company, defends the data, defends the information. Um, as I alluded to, it stems from the military, uh, the war games within the, the military, uh, red is always seen as the enemy, blue is always seen as the good guys, uh, and that's where the colors come from and why they're attributed to the aggressor or the testers versus the uh, cyber defense folks. Um, it actually started uh, going, leveraging John's uh, history lessons that we usually get from in an OCC, uh, all hands. It stems from a, a Prussian uh, general that started back in the 19th century. He was the first one to not only use maps and identify where the armies were to track and perform strategies, but they actually turned that into doing scenarios uh, and actually performing a war uh, you know, with their own uh, leadership and identifying the different actions that they may take, as well as having somebody on the other side 
changing their actions as they go. And that became the red team. So <clears throat> it was not just pure strategy, pure planning from a war perspective. It was what's the other team going to do, the other country, other army going to do, and how do we defend against that? So we take that into the cyber side, and it's the exact same thing. How do we prevent what their objectives are, what they're trying to test or compromise, uh, and then take the results of that and improve our defenses? Um, so we know there's going to be gaps. They're going to find a way in, give enough time, energy, resources. Anybody can compromise any system. Uh, the safest way is just to disconnect the Internet, which we know we can't do because everybody's interconnected, and, and that would just break the business. So end of the day, it's red team, blue team testing is a, is a way to technically identify gaps and remediate those prior to an actual attack uh, or threat, uh, you know, security incident within the organization. So, Andrew, one of the challenges in the exchange environment are all those so-called low-latency connections that the trading firms use to make sure they can uh, be on the market appropriately at all times and essentially provide instantaneous liquidity. How do you manage that uh, operational interaction, uh, making sure that there aren't any um, extraneous messages that could be causing damage to uh, ultimately the trading system, the market as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. There's there's multiple security controls that we have for that. And honestly, you, you protect that the same way that you protect anything else is you use industry best practices. So on those SIP connections, on the low latency networks, you ensure that there are a level of checks and balances as you go through validating the data, making sure that everything is accurate, and then checking the data again to making sure that it's being received, nothing's malicious going across the network. And then you put those security uh, roadblocks in place to say only company A is allowed to access on this port and, and do these finite amount of things. And that segregation of duty between the companies is how you se secure the data. And a lot of these companies are putting their hardware in your data centers. So Absolutely. You standards for that? Absolutely. So there are standards. Uh, we do not allow those to connect to our network. Obviously, it's a, a little bit of the Wild West in some cases, but we allow them to put data into our data centers for those low latency connections. We do scans of those networks, and we do work with our third parties quite uh, consistently to say, hey, we, we notice this inside. You may want to make sure that your configuration is updated. Here's how you make sure that your devices are more secure. So we're helping the entire community. So like David said, we're all in this together. We all have a, uh, a hand in the fight to combat security threats. So that's what we're here to do. David, uh, another concept in this industry is so-called defense in depth. Can you talk about how that works and Again, think about uh, the giants who obviously have a lot of depth versus the smaller folks that may not have uh, that much depth. So would you be angry if I punted defense in depth to the people who actually implement it? I think that might be a fine uh, But, but I'm I'll not going to totally up. punt. So um, because I am punting, I'm going to give you time to receive the ball, <laughs> right? So, so – um, for me, right, especially small firms, uh, and I think big firms too, um, I made the mistake, as I said when I first started, of thinking of cyber as like a cost, right? It's something I had to do. My regulators were making me do it, right? They were all over me. Um, what I was not thinking about, but I'm like totally an evangelist for, like this is actually why I'm here, is think of cyber, think of privacy as capabilities, Right. So if you're a small firm or big firm, but I really you know, I'm a lover of small firms. Right. Think about security and privacy strategically. Right. So that means go to your board and talk with them about what your objectives should be strategically in these two spaces. Right. When you're doing your roadmap, your strategy roadmap, your product roadmap from the inception. Right. Think about security and privacy. These are not bolt ons. Right? These are things that, as you're thinking about your vision, right, make security and privacy your mission. Right? And then that will force you, as opposed to, in hindsight, you know, reacting to things. You're thinking, okay, this is actually an advantage to this pro product. Right? I, can, I built this in from the core. Right? And not only are you obviously going to be safer, but from a business standpoint, you're going to have a differentiator from people who are like, yeah, I'm safe. Right? Yes. So what? Right? Show me you're safe. 
show me you can uh, you protect my privacy. Well, let me show you my product. All right. So oh. can I now? Can I? Absolutely. Uh, so, Eric, the New York Giants have punted to the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jets, for the record, <laughs> which explains a lot. <laughs> How are so, you going to handle this ball? Yeah, so defense in depth. Um, I tell you what, Andrew, why don't you take the technical side, and I'll take uh, some of the right, user so side. They, oh, they, they well, no. again over the, the Eagles. Eagles. <laughs> yeah. so there so we go. go. We're going to throw, throw an interception <laughs> from this. Dallas to, to the Eagles. But first, uh, I'll, I'll spend some time on the end users, right? So defense in depth is not just technology, not just um, you know bits and bytes. It's the end users, and end users spanning the entire thing. So you have developers that have to understand the, the applications they're developing are secure, um, how a threat actor might interact with that application to steal data, to, to, to impact the data. Um, all the way through, everybody here uses email, right? So there's the phishing attacks, there's the be, uh, business email compromise attacks, which someone pretends to be John, asking you to send them gift cards to Target. You know, and so defense and death from an end user perspective is just as important as the technology and understanding that everybody has a play or a part in protecting the, the companies. All right, so I'll take it. So this is where I, I could really dive into the matrix since we all start seeing the green screen. I love the, the technical side of defense and depth. So I'm going to use an analogy to, to kind of bring my point across. When you look at a, a secure building, uh, defense and depth, you start by asking that question is, what are the threats that are coming in? Well, what's the risk of a semi-truck driving through the front door? Okay, if I'm worried about that, I'm going to put a checkpoint out a couple hundred yards, poles, so a truck can't drive through there. Okay, I allow foot traffic into there. Next layer, allow people into my lobby. I have a security guard. How do you get past the security guard? Okay, I have a badge that allows you into the building. What's next? I have a pseudo man trapper, an elevator that only allows a certain amount of people. That elevator will not allow you to get to different floors unless you have a different badge to get there. Each one of these are different steps to secure that building to make sure that you're A, slowing down the attacker, you're seeing everything that's going through, and you're only accessing the th items that you need to access on a daily basis. So if you're not authorized with a semi-truck to go in, you're not going to make it. If you don't have a badge, you're not going to make it. So each one of these is the way to slow down that data. While we know in, in security that efficiency and security kind of are contradicting, right? So the more security we put onto systems, the, the less efficient they become because you can only fit so many people inside that elevator. You can only fit so many semi-trucks at, at the checkpoint uh, before they start backing up. So this is where you work with the development teams. You work with each of the network teams to make sure that you still have all the operational controls, the security controls that you need, but that data is still going through in the way that it was intended. Great. That was very clear. Thank you. All right, David, I'm not going to let you to uh, <laughs> expect play that. offense too long. <laughs> so... One of the interesting, and we have more and more international investors in our options markets now, one of the interesting restrictions in a number of countries is the prohibition of data, particularly PII, moving across national boundaries. How does a firm like yours or people in the industry handle those sorts of restrictions in terms of uh, the privacy laws in those particular countries, yet the the challenge of doing international finance, international commerce. So I'm literally shaking my head because I have the angel on one side saying, this is the plug for my company. <laughs> right? And the other, like, don't do it. So, so, um, what, so, so you're exactly right. So because of the differential privacy laws, um, the Europeans do not like and, in fact, prohibit data transfers from the EU to the United States. And it's not just the EU. There are data, they're called data localization laws. Um, you're required to keep the data in the geographic location where the data resides, right? So there's a lot of different, a lot of different pieces. Um, the US and the European Union came to an agreement called the Privacy Shield. And it's interesting, the Privacy Shield really is the Europeans' distrust of our government 
for sniffing their data that they're sending to U.S. companies. Would we do something like that? No, we would never do anything (laughs) like that. So so, uh, what my company has done um, is that we, at a very granular level, control data. So we can allow companies to set up, either on-prem or in the cloud, their own uh, realm and control their data. And then the data is, I like to call it like double D identified, so that analytics can be applied to the data without the data ever leaving the locale. And the questions and answers are both encrypted. So I can send it, because you're even, you're even, if you ask the question, is David Harris a customer in the UK, right? You have leaked personal information just in that thing. So to have the ability to have an encrypted question to encrypted data and get back a yes without data leakage um, is essentially what we do. Mm. Right? We do other things too, but that's part of what we do. Gotcha. Let's see if there are any questions out there. And C is a bit of a challenge with these lights. Any questions from the audience? Don't everybody stand up at the same time. All right. (laughs) Happily, I have some. (laughs) So let's go person by person. Uh, Eric, you get to start. From your perspective, the three highest cyber threats to the financial services industry, not now, but a year from now, in 2023. Uh, is this on the record? <laughs> uh, so I think, I think uh, over the last couple of years, in, in the next couple of years, we're going to see more um, threats to third parties. So supply chain mm-hmm. threats, uh, vendor threats. Um, they're no longer targeting just the companies and the targets themselves. Now they're looking at how can they infiltrate earlier in the process and get more um, opportunities later on. So, you know, think of somebody like, well, we won't use a vendor name. So, think of somebody that sells a device or sells something. They're they're <clears throat> compromising that device while it's being built or while it's being uh, transported to an end end destination. So, at that destination, they now have access that we may not know about until it's too late type thing. So you're going to see more of the third party. I think cloud is going to be another big area only because we're all trying to move to the cloud for the efficiencies and the, uh, um, the gains there. Uh, and so they're going to pivot from individual companies to looking at those cloud providers and seeing what they can do there. I think those are the biggest ones I see. Great. Andrew? Yeah, from, from my side, uh, I, I agree. I also think that the attackers are going to continue the social engineering attacks, right? It's very effective. When you look at social engineering across your company, uh, say a small to medium-sized company with 20,000 people, protecting each one of those 20,000 people by security education, training, awareness, uh, phishing tests, If they receive an email, all it requires is one person to click the link, one person to install that software, one person to put in their username and password across 20,000 different people. So we have to be very strategic and and saying we need to protect 20,000 and everybody needs to be right, right? If we have one failure, that's a failure for us. Whereas you look at an attacker, an attacker only needs to be right once. And that's the scary part of it is when the attacker goes out, they're doing a spray and pray method. And it's, it's effective. And we see that uh, in many companies today, that's the number one attack method that, that is coming through. Second is vulnerability. So secure your applications. I think those two are going to continue. Uh, just like Eric mentioned, the vulnerabilities might be uh, within the company. But now the attackers are seeing those devices and, and are getting a mass impact because everybody's going to be running X product. And if that X product has a vulnerability, they can cause more destruction along the way. So do you do drills with uh, emails that your red team Absolutely. sends out to people? Absolutely. And, and what is the uh, sanction for screwing that up a couple of times if I click on the link that I wasn't supposed to click on? So we do tests all the time uh, with phishing. Uh, as Eric mentioned, we also do the purple team tests, and, and that's actually my bread and butter. Uh, we were just talking about this backstage. I really get giddy uh, during a purple team because <laughs> that's when I get to really geek out and, and start playing with the ones and zeros again. So we do those phishing attacks to see, okay, how far can an attacker go if they got a uh, credentials from one of our organization? When is our blue team going to pick that up? 
When are we going to start seeing uh, some of that? So fishing tests, obviously uh, fishing is, is extremely important to protect against. We do training. With our users, uh, we send out tests. And if you click on the link, it'll pop up uh, a web page and say, hey, you have failed. If you failed one time, you're going to get a notification, right, saying, hey, please be more mindful. Second time, your manager is going to be notified. And then you're going to start attending some training, some very targeted training. You may even get a phone call from me saying, hey, this is really important. Here's what I need you to do. And if you continue to fail these, it's a risk to the company. So we will evaluate, does this person, if they cannot conform, are they doing other parts of their job correctly? Do they even need to be employed here? Thank you. And David, thoughts on? I don't worry about anything. I love it. <laughs> I mean, this is, this to me, this is kind of the future of what we're talking about up here, bluntly. Um, Social engineering is brutal, I think, right? I, we, had a, we have a common friend who um, hired, I guess now I, I know will call it a red team, right, to come in and try to breach their network, and they got in by making an appointment with someone they knew who was not in the office. Mm. So they came in, got to the front desk, uh, said, you know, is Mark around? No, he's at lunch, right? Uh, oh, I got the day wrong. I'll be back tomorrow. Right, but you know, sorry to bother you, and left a bunch of uh, key fobs, like the you know the hard drives, right, with their company name on it. So it looked totally innocuous, right? Sorry to trouble you. Here's some sales stuff, mm-hmm. right? And you know, it's just human nature. You're walking by the front desk, you see a big bowl of you know hard drive, you know little things, and people plugged them in, and um, you know, it took their security group about a month to pick out what was going on. And in the interim, these people had taken all of the, this is just an exercise. They took all of the customer data, all the clearing data. They got into everybody's personal documents and took individuals' uh, passwords for their bank accounts. Like, it was like unbelievable. So, but I do think one thing I do care a lot about and worry about is kind of um, a loss of trust so there was an incident, uh, which I love to talk about because I'm no longer regulated, um, <laughs> at, 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 at the SEC. Sounds like nirvana. I you? know. It actually is pretty good. I actually counted the days. I'm five years exactly out of the industry. Um, the, so there was an article in the Wall Street Journal about um, how SEC enforcement attorneys got access to the documents of the administrative law judges. Ooh. Right. So as we know, right, there's long been criticism that the SEC is too cozy between the ALJs and the enforcement division. I'm excessively enforcement. Right. So I love that. Um, but the rea- and they fought, you know, that they're not commingled. Right. But it's hard to make that argument when your lawyers have access to the judge's documents. Right. So, you know, it is that type of loss of trust. And I know a big theme of the conference has been the rise of retail. Well, the rides of retail are my kids, right? They're in their mid-20s, right? They don't trust anybody or anything. They get a whiff of something going wrong. They're not doing their business. You know, they're pulling their business out. So um, I think, you know, for me, you know, worrying about uh, integrity and maintaining it is going to be key for us. Andrew, one of the key risks in keeping cybersecurity defenses up is the recruiting and retention challenge of personnel. How is NASDAQ, with all those different locations, need for a bunch of different languages, how do you manage that risk in your, in, in your company? Absolutely. So hiring security professionals is tough. It's very tough. So one of the things that we do is we try to retain uh, the people as best as we can. Uh, Obviously, uh, money and salary can go so far. But more importantly, it's having a good manager, having a good cohesive environment where you come into the organization and it's almost friendship. You're happy to come to work. The morale is high. And that's tough to do in, secu- in security operations. So keeping those that morale high, it allows people to come into the uh, into work every day and say, "I want to show up to work." Versus when you wake up on morning and say, "Ah, oh, I got to go to work today." I don't like to to hear that. If if I actually hear that, and I've talked to my team several times, if somebody's saying that, how do I change it? 
So how do I get you to wake up on Monday morning and say, hey, you know what, I want to show up. I want to go to work because this is fun. A, a lot of times security operations, this is a hobby for, for most of us, right? It's very stressful. Uh, <laughs> we get hit with attacks uh, every day, and, and we respond to threats. So that morale has to be higher. You're going to see a dip. So starting with colleges, uh, we do a lot of speaking, uh, a lot of mentoring, a lot of internships that will come in. We teach them, and, and we start retaining and going through and rotating. So luckily for, for me, we have a very high morale within the team, so our uh, retention is pretty high. Great. Well, I'd like to thank our panelists very much. I think it's been a very interesting set of conversations and appreciate uh, participation and attention in the audience. And do remember that all of you are the first line of defense and social engineering is real. Uh, you probably get dozens, if not hundreds of emails between your personal account and your text messages on your various cell phones and your work email. Uh, every day. There is danger potential in each of them and probably danger in fact in many of them. So continue to be vigilant and that's your part in cybersecurity. Thank you very much everyone. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com.